In the unknown side of WoW, we simply go over many things that you probably didn't know about the game, with a lot of the items in today's video being somewhat related to Nagran. Completely unintentionally, I might add. I didn't actually notice until I was finished with the video. So, to start off, we'll be going over a uniquely named Broken Draenei. Located in the city of Telar in TBC Nagran, there is an NPC named Warden Moy BFF Jill. His name is a reference to an old commercial about a cell phone plan, in which a mother is trying to ask her daughter why the phone bill is so high, and she responds by saying that she was talking to her best friend Jill in SM and shorthand out loud. Who are you texting 50 times a day? I became my BFF Jill. Now originally, his name was a little bit more noticeable as a reference to SMS shorthand, as before patch 2.3, his name was actually Warden Eilol. And because of the font in game, it made his name look exactly like Warden LOLOL, since the I at the beginning of his name looks exactly like a lowercase l when it's capitalized. And for some reason, people didn't like this character having a joke name. So they changed it to another joke name, which wasn't as obvious a reference as Warden LOLOL. And boy, BFF Jill still doesn't seem like a regular name, but I guess they thought it was better than LOL. And in today's episode of Lore Reader Tales, where we go over the history of minor characters throughout Warcraft, we will be talking about Mogor the Ogre. Mogor was a two-headed ogre who led the Laughing Skull Clan during Warcraft 2. A little history about two-headed ogres? The two-headed variant is very rare, and are usually the only ones capable of casting spells. In Warlords of Draenor, we see the past version of Mogor, and he only has one head, but also has a mage's staff attached to his back, indicating that he may have had some affinity for magic. During the Second War in Warcraft 2, Gul'dan was able to use some of the elven rune stones to turn a whole bunch of his ogres into two-headed ogres, which was a huge boost to his fighting potential, as all ogres were physically stronger than pretty much all other races already, and this also gave them the ability to use magic on top of that. So, think of two-headed ogres as pure battle mages, who don't really have a weakness. Although, one of the downsides of having two heads was that it also gave them two personalities, and they would often bicker or fight with each other. Although Mogor was one of the lone exceptions as his two heads seemed to share the same personality and were incredibly intelligent. After he was turned into a two-headed ogre, he somehow made his way back to Draenor and became the leader of the Laughing Skull Clan, who was originally left behind because they weren't trustworthy. Sometime after the Horde lost the Second War, Ner'zhul was going around collecting artifacts so that he could open up a whole bunch of portals in Draenor, so that they could conquer a whole bunch of other worlds besides Azeroth. Doing all of this is what eventually blew the planet up and created the Outlands we have today. Although Mogor didn't want this to happen, and actually decided to side with the Alliance. And in exchange for the Alliance helping him take control of the Blade Edge Mountain, he would get them a powerful artifact known as the Book of Medivh. And he actually kept his word. He was able to secure that powerful book and was able to dodge and outsmart Ner'zhul's assassins along the way. And the Alliance was able to eventually use the Book of Medivh to close the portal. And that plot thread wasn't touched again until the Burning Crusade. Then in the Burning Crusade, Mogor makes a return to Nagran running a Ring of Blood type battle arena, and is also incredibly stupid like all other ogres. If you do the quest, you can eventually fight him after you defeat all of his champions, and then you just kill him and that's it. The incredibly intelligent leader of the Laughing Skull clan was relegated to a bloodthirsty brute. So they just completely retconned his character. Mogor is also the ogre depicted in the Hearthstone card Ogre Magi, which is part of the base set and even has his own Hearthstone card named after him, which unfortunately takes after his Burning Crusade counterpart, and has a whole bunch of his dumb ogre dialogues. Moga Dessa? No. Moga Destro- oh, wait. No. Moga Kill! Moga Charge! And that's basically the end of Mogor's story. He started off as an intelligent, capable leader, and then they decided to just turn him into one of many dumb ogres that you faced. Sorry. Uh oh. And now for a Warcraft mini fact. Did you know, out of all of the pet classes, hunters are the only ones that actually have to resurrect their pet? For the Warlock, if one of their demons die, they simply just resummon it. 
For death knights, same thing. If the ghoul dies, they just summon another one. Mages also just resummon their frost elemental if they have that chosen. And pretty much all the other temporary pets just stop existing once they go away. Although hunters don't have the option to just resummon their pet if it dies. They actually have a resurrection spell they can use to bring it back. And since it counts as a real resurrection, other players can also resurrect a hunter's pet. Or if you want, you can use a battle res in order to bring a hunter's pet back to life. Although that would be a huge waste of a battle res, seeing as the resurrection ability that hunters can use can also be used in combat. Now, it's a wonder why only hunters have to bring their pet back to life, whereas demons basically just go back to the twisted nether when they die, and they just resummon the exact same one back. Same case for the frost elementals, and I'm not really sure how the ghouls work with death knights. I assume they just have an endless supply of corpse dust that they use to create brand new undeads every time they have to make a new one. It makes sense that the people who just simply summon a creature don't have to worry about dealing with a dead body. But it seems to be one of the few fantasy elements left to the hunter class and their pet. And now, for something you can obtain in WoW. Located in Stormheim, there is a rare NPC called the Stormwind Matriarch, which has a pretty short respawn timer, and when you kill it, drops a pet called the Stormborn Whelpling. Now, what's unique about this pet is the fact that it has the Arcane Storm Mana Surge combo, which is an incredibly powerful combo that allows you to defeat a whole bunch of pets in PvE pet battles, and is one of the easiest ways to obtain a pet who has this combo, who also has decently high attack. Basically, if you take a whole group of pets who only have Arcane Storm and Mana Surge, you have a good chance of beating pretty much any pet you come across. And what makes it even easier to get is the fact that the NPC you kill in order to obtain it, the Stormwind Matriarch, drops the pet every time you kill it. Or at least nearly every time you kill it. It's one of the few rare mobs who drops a pet, which drops it more than once after the first time you kill it. So you could just infinitely farm the Stormborn Whelpling if you wanted to which also coincidentally is why it's very cheap to buy on the auction house. And now onto the hidden side of WoW, where we'll be looking over the time loss protodrake Idna Gran. Located near the corpse of Kairos, the bronze dragon who brought Garrosh to Draenor, is the corpse of the long famous time loss protodrake, which was one of the very first creatures in game that could drop a mount, and was on an incredibly long respawn timer so very few people actually managed to get one, even to this day. And the dead body of the Proto Drake in the Grand is actually the exact same NPC that you can find in Northrend. As if if you hover over it with an add-on which shows you what mounts drop from items and stuff, it will show you that the NPC should have the Timelines Proto Drake mount on it, if you were able to loot its corpse. Now as to why the corpse of the exact same mount from Northrend is located in Warlords of Draenor, about three expansions away, can be explained by a couple of little easter eggs and nods around the area. For one, there's a lot of time-lost guards surrounding the area, so it makes sense that the time-lost proto-drake would be included in the area as well, if they were going to add an easter egg that shared the same name. There's also the corpse of Kairos nearby, who is a bronze dragon, and one can surmise by the color of the time-lost proto-drake that it's pretty similar to a bronze dragon. And also, one other little thing, if one was farming the Time Lost Proto Drake in Northrend, occasionally they would find out the Time Lost Proto Drake just straight up disappears at the end of its spawn cycle. You could find the NPC and then run after it to try to kill it for the mount, only for it to disappear as soon as you got to it. So the real reference of this NPC in Draenor could be the fact that when that would happen where he would disappear from people trying to tag it, it actually just slipped into another time dimension, and then eventually found its way all the way over to Draenor, in a place full of time-lost magic. Alright, and that's it for the video. If you know of any other fun facts about WoW that would be perfect for a video like this, I'd love to hear about that down in the comments. And also, if you enjoyed the video, make sure to share it around, because if the video does well enough, then I could probably make more of them more often.